بارزة وفموا إذا رأيت نيوب الليث بارزة فلا تظنن أن الليث يبتسم ومرهف سرت بين الجحفلين به حتى ضربت وموج الموت يلتطم فالخيل والليل والبيداء تعرفني والسيف والرمح والقرطاس والقلم Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome listeners, welcome dear audience to another one of our great sessions here at the Islamic Literature Society where we have an amazing book and we also have an amazing author. Uh, what's very interesting about this, this particular interview is the topic itself. It's not one that you would commonly read about or our previous interviews have even touched on. So it's something very unique. You definitely want to stay and listen to this particular interview. Now, respected listeners, the Islamic Literature Society was founded in 2019, and it has the aim of promoting, fostering, and developing a heightened appreciation uh, of authors and literary works of classical and contemporary scholarship. Now, we do this in a number of different ways. We have book reviews. If you go to the website, you'll see, mashallah, a lot of people reading books and writing their comments and reviews on those books. Uh, likewise, uh, book clubs, we try to formulate people come together, uh, read a particular book and discuss it. And the most direct and the most informative way uh, I personally feel are the interviews where we get to have one on one with the author and ask them questions which you might not get to hear answers to normally or even get to hear those questions. So let us begin by introducing our very special guest for the session. Uh, let's bring him in, inshallah. So with us today, we have Brother Saf Chaudhry. Um, the brother is studied philosophy at King's College, KCL. Uh, upon completion of his studies, he's also been abroad and he studied in the prestigious University of Al Azhar al Sharif in the Faculty of Al Sharia Islamia, inshallah, Islamic law. Um, and he returned in 2016, where then he completed his post grad um, at SOAS as well. Uh, mashallah, brother has a PhD and he's published that, and it's on the life of Abdul Rahman as Salami. If I pronounced that correctly, if I haven't, I'm sure he'll correct me. Uh, further to that, uh, brother Saf has is a qualified teacher for over ten years. Uh, mashallah, in experience in teaching, and he's recently completed his second book, and, and that's on the topic of on the problem of evil. Subhanallah. So that's going to be a very interesting one. So we'll have him back talking about that particular book. But today's book, okay, today's book, let's put that to the camera, a trustee's on disputation and argument. So a book on mantiq or uh, logic. So I'd like to welcome uh, Brother Saf Chaudhry. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Sheikh. I hope you're well. You're okay here. Yeah. Alhamdulillah, I'm very well. How are you today? Alhamdulillah, it's, it's a glorious day today. It uh, is. Alhamdulillah, yeah. we're well. We're well. Actually, there's a lot of noor on your camera. I can see you nice and bright. Oh, wow. Yes, it's a, it's a background window. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, it's a fantastic uh, society. You know, you, you, you brothers are running, and I hope uh, our community and beyond support it. And uh, pray that Allah gives you tawfiq to carry it on um, from strength to strength. Uh, it's, it's really, really good. It's really, really good, mashallah. Alhamdulillah. We really, you know, trying our very best to get people to to read and, and, and to come together and really appreciate the history. You know, we've got so many knowledgeable people in our community and we really don't appreciate them. So like yourself, you know, um, we should be appreciating that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us gems. Um, Sheikh, so let us begin, or brother, let us begin. Um, what, um, when we talk about logic right or this particular book itself actually if i can ask you to you, you if you could give an introduction to this book i think that would be the best way to start so what exactly is this book okay all right so um i've, I've always tried to live by a rule where i, I want to try and write books that i wish i had when i was a student okay um, obviously you know uh, when i was young didn't have access to Arabic. Uh, alhamdulillah, I have a little bit of access now, um, but the, the, there are great books in, in, in Arabic and other languages, which I wish they were there in English. And one of the kind of books I wish was, was around was books about debating and logic, like what we call Munadara or, or Jidal. Um, so there weren't any books like that around. So it's always been on my mind to write something um, in English, very basic um, for the English readership. And so this book came about sort of as a result of that, um, after a lot of dithering as well. 
So what, what this book is, is a, it's, a, it's two parts. It's a translation of a small text by an Ottoman scholar, one of the great Ottoman, Shiyuk uh, Tashkub Rizadi. He, he died, he, he lived you know, sort of late into the 16th century. And he was a Qadi, you know, very, he had an encyclopedic knowledge as well. He wrote a little text about the rules and etiquettes of debating. Okay. And um, it's, it's a very, very basic text it's for students to memorize and to master and then to use practically. And, mun, and, and, and the subject matter is munadhar or, or debating and discussing. And munadhar, uh, some of the, the basic definitions that ulama give just for our audience so they know what, what it actually means. Sure. Some people have defined it as um, adab al bahth wal munadhara, the, the, the science of argumentation and debate. هو علم يوصل به إلى كيفية الاحتراز عن الخطأ في المناظرة. So this science is, or this subject of debate and argumentation is supposed to um, teach us to be careful of making mistakes when we debate. Okay. Now, one of the ways in which we protect ourselves from making mistakes in debate um, is, we learn this, is we learn the science of logic. So one of the ways in which we can protect ourselves from making errors in our arguments is to study the science of arguments, which is oh. logic. So if we want to study grammar, for example, uh, so if we want to make our language correct and valid grammatically, we have to study ilm al-sarf and nahu things like that. So similarly, when we're arguing in a debate context or just generally when we're making claims, we need to know the science that enables us to make valid claims. Sure. Um, and that's the ilm al that's, that's the science of logic. Right. So okay. I'll start this book. Yeah, to, to try and translate this. Sorry, Chef, to interrupt you. And, and, then, yes. and then to try and tra trans... So I translate that text into English with some notes. And then the rest of the book was kind of like supportive, um, supportive material on logic, mainly on logic, um, to help the reader understand the different areas of logic and how logic can help in argumentation. Okay, very good, very good. So, uh, brother, a very kind of simple question, but one that you might have you might have been asked before. Uh, wouldn't one say that in terms of presenting an argument or bringing your view forward as a Muslim, you you just need the Quran and you just need the Sunnah and you can just that's it. You've presented your argument. Um, why do you need to have ilmul manadra? Why do you need to have you know these logical debates? What does it add more to Quran and Sunnah? Yeah, now that that's a very very important question. Um, you see, when we reason, all of us reason, right? We make inferences. So we, we, we look at something and then we make conclusion, we draw conclusions from what we observe or analyze or something like that. So the, these are inferences and we're doing this every day. We open the window, it's wet on the windowsill, wet on the floor, we assume maybe it was raining. So we make these kind of inferences all the time. Um, so, uh, when we, inf when we make these inferences and when we reason in a certain way, the, when we formalize that, when we, we make it into um, steps, um, that's where logic comes in. So it helps us to identify where the steps in our thinking and reasoning. Sure. Um, it's not man I'm not saying it's mandatory that, that we learn it. What, but what it does help you to do, though, is it helps you to identify maybe the steps in your argument there may be errors. So if someone picks out an error in what you say, logic will help you identify what that error is. So in the Quran, we have that as well. How Allah, Jalla for example, um, identifies a number of um, very bad arguments against the Anbiya, alayhim as that, mm. that the enemies of the Anbiya mm. put in order to re re advance, in order to reject the message. So Allah identifies them and says, look how silly they are. And then he tells us, Jalla wa'ala, where it's silly. So I think it's important. The Anbiya came with hujaj, with evidence and arguments, even though they didn't come with logical steps. Um, but it's just like grammar. The, the Sahaba knew Arabic grammar. They knew it. They, they, they spoke eloquently. It just got formalized afterwards. Right. So it's like that. Yeah. yeah. OK, mashallah. It's good. Um, coming into the, the book. Uh, right in the beginning, the is in a very interesting part overview of argumentation. Um, in here, you make the author makes mention of ten essentials, and I found that really nice, really really good way to uh, open the book or start the book. And you talk about things like definition, 
uh, your things that merits relationships also and so on and so forth. How important are these 10 principles as such? Just, you don't need to go through all 10, but in general, how important is it to, you know, agree on a definition or to understand the fruits of what you're talking about? Yeah, that's very, very important. I think you're talking about the Mabadu al Ashara, the 10 year, the 10 essentials by Imam Ali al Sabban. So, yeah, I mean, any student who studies any what we call fun, as you know, or subject or discipline, they're often given these 10 key areas. Every subject has can be identified or categorized with 10 important questions or essentials. So what is the definition? Um, you know, what is the subject matter of the, of, the, of the discipline you're studying? What's the fruits of the, the discipline, the merits, etc.? So you're right. It's, 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 this is what these 10 essentials are to give a student an overview about a subject that they're studying. And, you know, by getting that, by getting those 10 essentials, you get an overall parameter. You get the boundaries of that fun, of that discipline. Sure. And so I thought I'd open the book in emulation of, you know, scholars who do that in every book for mm. students. They, they begin with the 10 essentials. Mm. And so, yeah, and the first one we always begin with is a definition of what is the definition of the subject you're studying. Right, exactly. Um, there may not be absolute agreement on the definition, but there is a definition. And the definition I quoted at the beginning was that Adab al Bath wa ilm yusal bihi ila kafiyat al ihtiraz an al khata al munadara. The science of debate is supposed to protect you from making errors in debate. Now, if I could just quickly mention the reason why it's important for us not to make errors in debate it is that as as muslims we are we're obligated to follow um the sharia where we have an aqidah we have a belief we're obligated to, to follow islamic law or sharia yeah and so um it could be it could be that we may have incorrect ideas about debate and argumentation we may have incorrect ideas about them because Islam came to change ideas about argumentation and debate and things like that. There, there is a, a blameworthy type of debate and there is a praiseworthy type of debate. We may not know, know the difference between the two. The other aspect is, is our conduct has to be based on the noble you know, rubrics of the Sharia. So if we're not behaving properly in a debate or, or a discussion context, then we'll be going against, against the Sharia. Mm. So unless we study the rules of debate and argumentation, we may be carrying incorrect ideas and we may be behaving incorrectly with people. And unfortunately, I see it. Some people send me links on social media and sometimes we see, um, you know, it, it may not be the best conduct we're displaying when it comes to debate and discussion. Yeah, and it, it, you've probably experienced lots of people debating an issue, but they, because of the very fact that they haven't agreed on the definition, they, they, they're comparing uh, apples with bananas and it's just uh, That's right. That's right. fighting. That's right. <laughs> That's right, exactly. You're just fighting now over something that you disagree on in the beginning and you didn't define your terms and it's a waste of time, isn't it? It becomes a waste of time. Yeah, and I really appreciate what you said about the, the other part because you've got, a, you've got a discussion in your book about the adab al-bahth. So it's not just a fact of, I mean, that's the research part, but not just the, the fact that we learn how to debate, but we also learn how to carry ourselves, which is so important as Muslims in discussions, right? Because you can have the haq, right? And then, but... If, the, if you deliver it in a way that's repulsive, right? It doesn't matter if you've got gold in your, you know, it, it's not going to work. Chucking mm -hmm. a book at someone's head is not going to get them to, to absorb us in the book. Mm. So you're, you're right about the conduct, the adab has to be there. Otherwise, yeah, and I think it's very it's similar to it. a statement that Imam Shafi'i made, right? He would say whenever he would get into any kind of debate, um, he would make dua to Allah that if he, he'd be shown the truth, if he's wrong, that Allah shows him that he's right, and if he's right, that the person sees the truth. So it was such a humble approach to discussions. Absolutely, and that's sincerity at the highest level, because he's looking for the truth. Right. Rahimahullah, he's not, it's not ego. Right. Um, so um, when you translated this book, I'm sure there must have been a number of books that you could have translated. Was there any particular reason to why you chose this particular trustees on, on on this topic yeah like i said i mean the, the alhamdulillah we've got a lot of fiqh works in english alhamdulillah works on usul yeah uh, hadith uh, ilm al hadith as well usul al hadith as well tafsir um but 
there are a few subjects where uh, that was part of our curriculum, even in Al Azhar Sharif, as, as you know well as well. Um, so uh, there, were, there were there were certain funun that were part of our curriculum, and and they they kind of just petered out. So ilmul balagha, right? Um, can you see? Yeah. So ilmul, you know, this is a wonderful science. Uh, unfortunately, even in our madaris. It's not really taught um, yeah. like the seminaries here in the UK. I can't speak obviously globally, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's probably a similar situation mm. where they don't have that subject um, or it's not given prominence. Another topic, mantik, logic, which is part of the, the curriculum and argumentation and, and adab of bath uh, and that that was just disappeared. Um, and I thought, let me try and bring it to the, to the fore so others can take up maybe the interest and, and do a better job and run with it. Mm. Um, so that was the kind of thing in, in my mind, the original aim in my mind, get it to a, a readership, a simple book, Yeah. get it to a re English readership. Okay, mashallah, good. Um, uh, furthermore, in another chapter in your book, chapter three, uh, you talk about some of the more technical stuff and you talk about um, the outline of logic and in here you mentioned different types of arguments uh, subhanallah I was, I was quite surprised there's seven different types of arguments um can you just briefly tell us what are the different types of arguments what does that so somebody who's never studied this topic what does that even mean like deductive and inductive and so on so what yeah. i okay so um I hope if anyone's got the book or is thinking of getting the book, not to not to be scared by that technical part. Right. Um, I think um, so. What I tried to do in in the in these sort of chapters is give like the scaffolding or extra material, so so students can go away themselves, follow it up with the teacher or their own you know their own through their own research. And so I thought, let me just set out what arguments are, because if you're going to debate and, and argue and discuss, you're going to be giving arguments. So you need oh. to know some of the mechanics of arguing. So I think two types of arguments are important for, our, for our, at least our audience or those who aren't familiar with logic. And, and, and that is one we call deductive arguments and the other is inductive argument. A deductive argument is just an argument where um, the conclusion that you make, it, it follows from the claims that you make, the statements or the premises you make. I, when you make your premises, if they're true, then your conclusion is gonna be true. It can never be false. And that's called deductive because you're moving from your premises to your conclusion and uh, you're following a kind of scheme or a form or a pattern. Um, so we call that deductive. And sure. that's what most people would know about logic. Like, you know, all men are, all men and women will die. You know, Abdullah is a, is a man, therefore Abdullah will die. Okay. How would Abdullah die? Because if he's, if he's mortal, if he's going to die someday, then we, and if all people are going to die someday and Abdullah is a person, then it follows that Abdullah will die someday. Mm -hmm. That kind of reasoning I think most people get. That's called deductive reasoning. Okay. So you're moving from your premise to your conclusion. So it's very logical. And inductive. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's it's very formal and it just follows the steps, like in maths. Right. An inductive argument is something where we kind of, um, it doesn't give us, abs we don't get absolute certainty like we did in that deductive way, but um, it's very, very strong. So induction is where, um, you know, we, we look at a specific set of data or we observe something then we make a generalization about it okay. so you might say oh i observe like um in this area um it looks like most people have pets then, it, then most likely maybe the whole area people have pets now it's not you're not sure whether everyone's got a pet but you're making a generalization um from from what you've observed okay so these two are are kind of uh, the broad two general ways we we use inference you know we, we infer and two types of logic that people will find most common mm -hmm. um, inshallah that's very very simple to understand well um yeah your, your your next element your next discussion in the book following on from arguments you talk about um fallacies um mm. 
I'm sure a lot of a lot of people watching this interview are you know followers of discussions at Hyde Park. <laughs> oh yeah. So they're probably yeah. going to want to know because this word is mentioned a lot. You see people saying, "Oh, that's a straw man argument." No, that's a fallacy. Uh, what what does that mean? Ah, okay. So because we're human beings, right? Um, there are when we make an argument, um, it may be that from the things that we claim our conclusion may not follow from the things we claim. And if we think our conclusion follows, then we've made an error in our thinking. Okay. So a fallacy is basically an error in our argument. We thought we can make a conclusion from what we said, okay. but we actually can't. And so if someone picks that out, then we have to step back and say, whoa, where did I make the mistake? I thought what I just said was all right. And I thought the conclusion that I made was all right. Um, but if someone is very sharp and has studied logic, and, and then they can identify it. And there are lots of fallacies. And I, I think this is very important for generally to be on guard. And, and, and not just because of Hyde Park, yeah, if people who go to Hyde Park, but even the media who peddle very false arguments. Um, so I'll just give a simple one for our audience, just to, to, just in case. Yeah, please do. Familiar with. Please do. Yeah, with, with, with fallacy. So if if often we hear this, oh, um, well, you know, um, I've I saw every Muslim that I met, you know, it, you know, has has very dangerous beliefs. Therefore, all Muslims have dangerous beliefs. Now that that now you're overgeneralizing. That's fallacious. Right. Just because you met some people who may have had what you judge to be dangerous beliefs. You can't generalize that to the whole Muslim community. Mm. Mm. Um, so that will be a fallacy of, you know, of, of, you be you're overgeneralizing and you can't do that. Um, another fallacy will be something like this. Um, when you attack someone's character rather than their argument. Okay. So if I say, if I make a claim and say, oh, um, rationally, there's only one God. But then you turn around and you say, "Ah, oh, look at look at what you said. Look at what look at what you're wearing. Where'd you buy that from?" Right, right. Um, you know, where where's your garments from? You know, and then you start make you start attacking my clothing, which has got nothing to do with um, the argument. This is what Fir'aun did with Musa alayhi salam. When Musa alayhi salam gave him the hujjah about how can you be ilah, he goes, he points him. Look at this this hadha. He doesn't even give a name. He says, "Look at this one who can't even speak. Who stammers." Mm -hmm. So what? What stammering got to do with the haq that Musa is putting on you? Mm. Proof. Mm. He couldn't argue, so you have to play the man instead of the ball. And that, you know, so Allah brings that in the Quran. And in many places, Allah does that. He brings the false, he brings the fallacies, the muhalatat, we call that in Arabic, okay. of the a'da, the, the enemies of the NBA. And he, Allah brings them to show us these are bad arguments. Wow. SubhanAllah. I try to bring that in the book, these examples. Yeah, that's very interesting. I mean, there's understanding that depth, uh, an argument in that kind of depth. You can, as a Muslim, you can protect your your belief and protect your your, your principles. You know that somebody is attacking you or attacking, right. let's say, the prophet or something, not right. actually looking at the argument. You, you know, know, unfortunately, I'll tell you. I mean, the, a lot of the times now on on social, I don't, maybe I'm generalizing. So not a lot of the times, but what I've what I've been sent. Hmm. Oh, my clips if two people disagree with each other it starts to get personal right and they're having snipes and they're having swipes mm. and they're bringing them the wives into it or they're bringing their family into it or it's not about the hut anymore it's about playing the man or the mm. woman rather than playing the ball mm. um so rather than addressing the argument it's becoming and uh, and the du'at on the scene sometimes it goes overboard right it starts to get cussing it becomes cussing i understand that look I, I get sometimes there's a rhetorical element i get all that you know right right sometimes you can't just be a robot and put it in logic there's a rhetorical element but i think we know when we're stepping over the bounds and things like that so um even though we we know that some people probably deserve it you know but you know that, that kind of uh, <laughs> uh, that kind of scorn and 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 and, and but you know um, mm. But we've got to be careful, is what I'm saying. Yeah. Good, good. Alhamdulillah. Um, 
Yeah. Furthermore, then in your in your third chapter or three C, you've divided up into into letters. Three C, you have the etiquettes of, of the debate, which we've briefly already discussed. But mashallah, it's a very interesting topic here about the sources of the debate. So, as Muslims, when we're debating amongst ourselves, um, we have some limitations or we have some sources. What are those? Uh, you mean the sources of debate? Yeah. So the source of debate for for what I can see from our tradition is of course the Quran al Kareem. So right. The Book of Allah is a source. Yeah, is one of the primary sources because the Anbiya alayhim salam came with arguments. Sure. So Ibrahim alayhi salam saying, "Ya abdi lima ta'budu ma la tasma' wa la tubsir wa la tughni anka shay shay'a." That that's an argument. He's saying to, to his, fa yeah. his father, why are you worshiping something they can't hear, see, can't even benefit you? Look think about it. It's it. It's... So, but how does his father reply? And he says, are you shrinking from our, our gods? Ya Ibrahim. Ibrahim. I'll stone you if you don't, if you don't get away from here. So his father can't deal with the arguments. He has to resort right. to course mm. um so yeah so the quran is 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 one of the major sources uh of debate and and and, and adab of, of 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 argumentation and hiwar and conversation the other is a sunnah mutahara the beautiful sunnah of the messenger of allah who was the best who brought hujjah to ever set foot on the earth so the sunnah is the beautiful reservoir of conduct and how to debate and argue and and, and the sahaba radiallahu anhum ajma'in some of the best debaters conversationalists um you know there ever was because they learned from the best that ever was right um so they're a source the salaf al salih they're a source um the conduct of the salaf al salih because obviously the qarn of the quran of the salaf al salih the prophet you know, mention the the fadila of this gener of these generations, and then we've got works of um, falsafa when they were translated from the Greek, from Aristotle's works on logic and argumentation and things like that. That became a source as well. Okay. Um, so yeah, these are kind of five main sources from what our ulama wrote their books on. They drew from these sources. Okay. Okay. And. Uh... Brother, being somebody who's authored, uh, you know, this book on debate and munadara, and also your 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 PhD as well, um, how important do you think it is that um, as a Muslim community we invest in this science? Uh, you rightly said earlier on that we have a lot of books on fiqh and usul and so on and so forth, but not many on this topic. And Masha, what I really enjoyed about this as well, brother, is that it's not just a book of logic because there's loads of them out there, but you've really come from an Islamic angle. Uh, you know, talking about the sources and so on and so forth. How important do you think it is, um, let's say, for a book like this to be put into the Al Azhar syllabus? Let's say, so we've all had, we've had to go through something like this. How important is that? Okay, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has obligated us all to our ability to give da'wah. We yeah. have no choice. Um, everyone to our capability has to proclaim this deen. Has sure. to make has to give tabliq, um in that sense to deliver the call. Now, in order to do that, we ne we need to give arguments. We're going to enter into conversation with people. People are going to try and push us back. Um, why should I believe what you believe in? Isn't your prophet like this? Didn't you believe this? So people are going to bring counter arguments to us. So it, we can't escape the fact that we're going to have to debate, converse, discuss. Um, and so what we need to do then, if that is inevitable, is, is learn the science that will give us, tell us what we can do, what we can't do when okay. it comes to this issue of debate, discussing and arguing. So um, the reason why we want to do that is because we can then take the, this da'wah, this beautiful risala, in the best way, in the most beautiful way, emulating those who carried it in the best way which is the Anbiya Ali Muslim obviously than our prophet in our context and then the Sahaba so so we have to we have no there's no um there's no getting around it I, I can't have bad etiquette I can't deliver this deen with 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 a miserable with, with, with reprehensible conduct I can't deliver this deen 
um, with foul language. I cannot deliver this deen for my ego. I cannot deliver this deen for any other reason than for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for, you know. So for our community, it becomes a very important that we, we want to avoid the errors that perhaps other communities or individuals um, have fallen into. And we've got our own set of ahkam when it comes to these things, adab, rules, and boundaries. So we have no excuse. Just like in fiqh, as you know, we have to know the arkan of our amal, otherwise it's going to be incorrect. It doesn't yeah. matter how sincere you are. Yeah. If your arkan aren't there, it just if you're praying incorrectly, you might have the niya, but you haven't got the ilm for the arkan. Mm. So you've got to know your fardain. Mm. Okay. And so it's similar here. Okay, so, very good, very good, alhamdulillah. Um, so, you know, part and parcel of our society, the Islamic literature society, we try to encourage people to write, encourage people to read, encourage people to discuss and to debate. Um, how important do you think it is, uh, or, or your message out to the youngsters or those watching, um, for them to get involved in writing and reading uh, and, you know, getting involved in such subjects? I think it's very important. This is why, you know, the society, the forum that you, you brothers have set up is so important because another thing is, and I don't want to start a rant on this, right, for but we've forgotten how to write properly. Right. So how and why we don't write well anymore. Yeah, I can. I understand the arguments. We live in a text culture, and we're, we're using emojis more. I get all that, you know. And, and there's a long, there's a long sociological uh, thesis about it. But we're not writing very well, and believe it or not, we're not reading very well anymore. We just don't read, mm. um, and so the way we're the way we're absorbing information and processing it is very different. And yeah, it's to do with the technology and, and and our behavior patterns of how we consume information. But it's very it, it's. I know this sounds weird to say, but we got a graph. We got to read. We got to read books, um, and we got to write well. And that means looking at how people people who we like write well, emulating them. So I think it's very, very important um, for us to read, discuss what we read. So, you know, join the kind of book clubs you, you set up or get engaged, tap into what you brothers are doing, mashallah. And so I do urge and encourage our listeners, yeah. readers, whoever's joined, you know, yeah, tap in, please. Yeah. Um, so what if, what would be your... Sorry, what would be your response if somebody was to say, but you know, I, I can watch the video, bruv, it's on it's on YouTube. Why do I need to read the book? Oh, you can't, you can't make that argument. You just can't look. Learning is a different thing, you know. We're different learners, some people are visual learners and things like that. I get that. Um, but at some point for you to get it's not enough for for you to how can you substitute a book of an author from like a 10 minute interview? I, I don't know how you can do that. And what's the need then for the book? The book is where, you know, your mind engages. You can start to, you know, think what's being written, engage, jump into the book. Um, if the author's around, contact the author, get a discussion going, get your own thoughts going. There's a cognitive engagement you have that is that you won't get, your cognitive engagement you get from the book that you will never get from just watching uh, a, a podcast or a clip or a video, you just won't because it's a different in, it's a different format. Right, right. A book, yeah, a book is so important. It's so important for that. Okay, uh, brother, we, we're coming towards the the end of the interview. The sure. final one or two questions I have, mashallah, I've kept you with me for for a long time. Uh, the final question is regards to how important do you think it is, or is it important at all? that some of the du'ats, like you've been to Al-Azhar, you graduate from the faculty of Sharia, and you've decided to come back and do your PhD, and, and you're still writing, and you're still doing, you know, post and so on and so forth. How important do you think it is for du'at, graduates of Al-Azhar, or Medina, or whatever, that they should engage in, you know, a master's or a PhD in, in a Western university? I mean, of course, there are, there are benefits in studying um, in non-traditional settings, uh, there are there are there is benefits. I think you studied law, so you know you know you would know, uh, mm. mashallah. But uh, so yeah, so I think um, there is a critical component 
that un unfortunately we have lost in our traditional curriculum, but has been given a lot of emphasis and, and part of the learning training in Western you know, academic setting. So that critical element where you're, you're really pushed to think hard about what you say and what you write, to be critical and to be exacting and precise, to be analytical. Um, often those kind of skills are lost in our traditional curriculum and, and, and people get that when they study in non-traditional settings um, mm. in secular universities and they feel empowered because they've been given the tools now how to break down an argument, how to break down someone's claim, how to analyze, assess, evaluate, so these higher order thinking skills mm. and you know so if you haven't got if you haven't got that then you're going to have to acquire that um and then if you know then you can marry them both which a lot of people do the critical component with a traditional and then they've got a fusion um of skills and and, and knowledge so i think it's 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 important in that sense it's important in that sense but I must put a caveat, though. I must put a caveat. Yeah, course, go for it. If, if, if you're, if, of course, if you want to learn your dean, I, if it's dean you want to learn, then you need to go, you need to go to the sources of dean. Sure. Um, and then, and then the men and women who can um, link the sources of your dean to what's relevant, and important for you. So to the ulama and or, or you know sure. students. Who are, you know have that quali qualified training mm. so that's different that's different um if it's dean you want to learn then you need to go to the right places to learn your sure. dean sure um, that's that's a that's, that's a good argument and my final question to you is um when it comes to writing so maybe not phd is not everyone's cup of tea uh, but what about no, just writing articles or you know a book that they've read write about it or a topic that's on their mind you know how would you get people to pick up a pen and start writing what would be your word of advice I would say just um, don't don't try and be a perfectionist before you've even written anything. Mm. Um, many people stop because they want to think, I don't know how, you know, what if it turns out like this? What if I don't? It doesn't matter. Put it down. If there's something where where it's agitated your thinking and you really like it, write it down. Have a look at it. Um, one of the best ways to start to shape up what you've written is to pass it to someone who perhaps can give a a look have a look at it or discuss with you how to structure it yep. get your thoughts down what you could do you can shape it up and trim it and put it into a proper format and structure a bit later but get get your lump get your lump of clay before you start to mold it get your lump of clay then you can chisel it slowly by slowly into the shape or the statue or whatever it is you want so i would say just get your thoughts down type it write it um and the only way you're gonna you're gonna start to get better at it is to practice doing it, and to to emulate people who who who's writing who you like. There are many people who write well, right? But they never did. It. You know, it wasn't that that they naturally were just born to write well. It's yeah. a skill. Mm. It's acquired. It's about, yeah, it's a maharat. So once you want to to acquire that skill, you need to go about to acquire it. That requires practice, time, diligence. Obviously, tawfiq. And things like that so okay get things down then shape it later okay mashallah brother Safa, i really do appreciate the time we've gone you know well over the time i had promised you and uh, i've got a few more questions but i'm going to stop as well so i want to thank you very much for your time uh, stay you with us me. i just want to show share something with the audience and then um we can wrap things up if i can get the audience there we go respect listeners that's our website um the islamic literature society that's the home page and you can see a number of different books there books have got you know their reviews you've got a variety of subjects you've got history orientalism there's loads of books here that you can really get involved in you can write the reviews send them to us and we can get them read and then put up uh, with the books so you've got about us page uh, book reviews that's where you'll see them the journal inshallah we're going to get you know the journal approved very soon videos like the one you're watching here there's a list of videos let me actually open that and show you so that's our the, the last month's one dr shahrul hussein he talked about his book and we have a sister there she's talking about her book dr asim Qureshi, 
um, and Brother Joel. We've also got Jonathan A.C. Brown talking about his book, which is coming up as well, Slavery in Islam. So there's so much. And then there's a reading club as well. Find a local reading club where you can join and partake in, in these discussions. And there's a membership site where you can get um, some VIP treatment. You'll find out what that is when you click on that button. So um, the Islamic Literature Society, please do join us and you know share this with your friends and with your families. Um, Brother Saf, I'd like to thank you very much once again for coming. Inshallah, we will definitely have you on once we get a copy of your book on, on evil, as you said, Inshallah. So, Barakallahu Fiqh. Thank you. Inshallah, we'll meet soon again. Jazakallah khairan for having me. Work inshallah and stay with us. Respect the listeners. We like to wrap things up here. Thank you very much for tuning in. Don't forget to like the video. Don't forget to share it with your friends and families as well. And write a comment at the bottom. Uh, encourage others to 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 partake and discuss what you've read here in, in, or what you heard here. Sorry, in this uh, particular interview. We will see you all very very soon. Take care of yourselves. Keep safe. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. <laughs> تجوز عندك لا عرب ولا عجم والجمع ممن ضم مجلسنا بأن لي خير من تسعى به قدم ما لي أكتم حبا قد برى جسدي وتدعي حب سيفي